For the scripture today, I will be reading Psalm 64, verses 4 through 10. 68, I'm sorry, 4 through 10. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides upon the clouds. His name is the Lord, be exalted before him. Father of orphans and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God gives the desolate a home to live in. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious live in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain at the presence of God, the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you sh showered abroad. You restored your heritage when it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the need. Our second reading is taken from the Acts according to the, I mean, the Acts of the Apostles. And last week we were in chapter 17 of Acts, and now we've moved back to the very beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, not at that very first verse. Just to give you a little reminder, the Acts of the Apostles picks up where the Gospel according to Luke ends. Uh, that gospel ends with several appearances by the risen Christ, including the road to Emmaus, which we read a few weeks ago. And uh, so the book of Acts starts with uh, a reminder that Jesus has been appearing and uh, giving signs for 40 days as the risen Jesus has been about and being seen as living after the crucifixion and resurrection. And so now with verse six, uh, Owen, he has met with all of them together and they've asked him these questions. So starting at verse six through 14, Acts one. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When Jesus had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. Today's reading is about what believers do in the in-between. Jesus has been crucified, dead, and buried. After the initial appearances of the risen Jesus on the road to Emmaus and in other places and ways, his closest followers watch as he is taken up into the heavens. This is what Christians call the ascension. Can you imagine what they might have felt like? For over a month, they had been seeing him here and there and knowing that he is alive and death is not the end. But now he is truly gone. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 10, tells us, While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I can just see the followers. It was more than just those named disciples there at all of that. They look up into the sky as I would if I saw my teacher and friend and savior taken up into clouds of glory. I would have been screaming inwardly, don't leave us here alone. What are we going to do without you as our leader? It's almost comical when these two men in dazzling robes appear and ask them all, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is not the first time that two men in dazzling robes appear in their lives, in the lives of these followers. The writer of Luke's gospel, who were pretty confident is also the writer of the Acts of the Apostles. He tells us in the Gospel of Luke that after Jesus was crucified and placed in the tomb, uh, and after the women went back for the Sabbath because they couldn't take care of his body at that time because the Sabbath had come and they needed to return. And when they did, they found the tomb empty. Luke 24, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. So now in the book of Acts, after seeing for over 40 days what are called convincing proofs that Jesus had risen and was alive, they now see him taken up. Here is how UCC minister, the Reverend Martha Spong, describes the scene after the ascension. Still pondering the last words the risen Lord shared with them, they returned to the upper room where they prayed together. There we find the remaining 11 disciples, Judas Iscariot, had fled and died. The mother and brothers of Jesus and certain women, who apparently the author prefers to remain uh, anonymous, 
We can imagine them, Mary Magdalene, perhaps the sisters from Bethany, and other women who went to the cross and the tomb. This is the crowd that won't go home, the faithful remnant waiting for whatever would come, probably a bit stunned by the supernatural event they had witnessed. The men and women constantly devoting themselves to prayer could not predict what was coming next or what exactly they would be called to do, only that they would be witnesses to the world on behalf of Jesus Christ. When we experience a major transition in our lives or in the life of the church, we find ourselves similarly situated. Change can be exciting or unsettling, welcome or resisted, joyous or anxiety provoking, end quote. Take a moment to think about big transitions in your own life. Some of you may be going through them right now. Changing jobs, a new relationship or a broken relationship, moving, the death of a loved one, a difficult diagnosis, the birth of a baby, graduation, retirement. The list goes on and on. The familiar territory of day-to-day -day life becomes foreign or at least unsure. And we need guidance as to what to do next. We often build images in our minds or our hearts about what our lives will look like. It's natural to, to think about what our lives will be. And these expectations can be shattered in scary ways or opened up in wonderful ways with life's big transitions. Not knowing what comes next after a big change can be, as the Reverend Spong wrote, exciting or unsettling, welcome or resisted, joyous or anxiety provoking. Verse 14 of chapter 1 of Acts tells us that when this big group of Jesus' closest followers returned to the upper room, they prayed. One of the blessings of being part of a church family, whether we are new to that church family or have been involved for decades, one of the blessings is this kind of prayer network. Of course, cards and phone calls and flowers and meals can be wonderful, but praying for and with each other and praying for guidance in times of change is something that each of us can do. Whether you are six years old or 96 years old, you can hold someone in prayer. You can ask for guidance. When I served as a campus minister for college students, we would often organize a spring break mission trip where six to a dozen or so college students accompanied by a couple other adults would travel and they would learn about a place. They would do some work, of course, but they would be blessed by experiencing people's lives very different from them, either in locale or perhaps language or culture. The experience was sometimes life-changing for the young adults, and the adult chaperones found so much meaning and joy in getting to know the students as well as doing the work of the mission trip itself. During the academic year, there were many opportunities to support the students with home-cooked meals for student gatherings or uh, other forms of hospitality. 
But most of that support required mobility, a car, the ability to zip off to the grocery store and then take meals to the church. The mission trips afforded a special chance to enlist the support of the very oldest adults in the church. Each mission trip participant was paired with an older adult, many of whom were homebound. And that older adult promised to pray for their student or adult leader before the trip and every day of the trip. They each wrote a card introducing themselves to the student or the leader. And when the group got to the airport to depart, everyone opened those notes and read them and prayed together and started their journey, knowing that they were held in prayer as individuals, not just the church praying for the group, but individuals praying for individuals. Both the prayer partners, again, many of whom were homebound, and the students and leaders found it very meaningful. At South Plains, we hold each other's needs in prayer all the time. We're going to do that again in just a few minutes. The prayer quilt ministry gives a tangible sign, something you can hold on to, look at, and touch. A sign of this prayerful support. And I know that there are church members, I know of a couple by name, who not only pray on a Sunday morning, whether it's related to the prayer quilt or the people mentioned in prayer updates, but they also pray throughout the week for those people. Whenever the session meets our governing body here at the church, we begin and end our meetings with prayer. It's actually in the Book of Order that we are to do that. It's a reminder that as we begin our work, we seek God's guidance. As we conclude our work at the end of the meeting, we close with prayer and we give thanks for God's guidance and we pray for that guidance to continue. The regional governing body, the Presbytery, in our case it's the Presbytery of the James, those governing body meetings also, of course, begin and close with prayer. And when there is a controversial vote, which is, doesn't happen very often, but if it has been debated with passion on both sides that are very different, or maybe three or four sides, it's not unusual for the moderator of the presbytery to ask everyone to pause and to pray for guidance before the vote is taken. We don't always know what is, humming, what is coming next, which way to turn. God gives us the gift of prayer together to see us through. Acts chapter 1 is that reassuring bridge showing us that when we are in the midst of exciting or unsettling transitions in our lives, we not only have God's support, but we have each other. I'm just going to pause for a second. So Acts 1 is that reassuring bridge showing us that we, if we are in the midst of exciting or unsettling transitions in our lives, we not only have God's support, but we have the support of one another. When trust is built and fostered, the church's members can and do lean on each other. We are buoyed by prayer and we seek guidance with each other. This is true about our own life transitions and as this congregation and the church with a capital C continue to face ongoing changes in our world. Next Sunday, of course, is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. And the good news of scripture is that we know that others before us faced uncertainty during times of transition. Their witness of devoting themselves to prayer 
reassures us that we as believers and as friends and members of this congregation, we can do the same. Thanks be to God. Amen.